Thank you. Thank you, Mike. So from Sarah, how much radiation is this producing and how it's being contained? Again, for accelerator physicists. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's a good question and something we take very, very, very seriously. We have a dedicated radiation protection group at CERN um, who monitor, control, and really carefully police uh, the, the radiation aspects of what we do. Um, if you go into the LHC, in general, you can walk around the ring where the uh, main dipole magnets are, and it's, 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 it's relatively low radiation. But when you get near the experiments, the, uh, the actual collisions produce a lot of um, high-energy particles, which create um, some sig significant amount of radiation in places. So there, the access to those, those areas are very carefully controlled and monitored. Um, everyone is carrying dosimeters. Access to the machines is very uh, carefully controlled. You know, you have virus scans going into the LHC itself, and uh, you know, it's something we take very seriously indeed. Thank you, Mike. Some more questions. Uh, this is written very small. Why? What did you do during the period of maintenance? Uh, Patricia, what did CMS do uh, before starting Grand Tree for the last uh, two and a half years? Well, CMS did um, some maintenance and we did some upgrades of uh, the detectors. We did a lot of work on, we heard about the trigger system, so we, we did a lot of work on the electronics and to try to get ready for the next run and, and make sure everything was in perfect working order to start Run 3. At the same time, you continued publishing of course. <laughs> the research didn't stop. You know, because of course, of the we were, uh, many people were working on um, publications. We pub published more than 100 articles in scientific journals every year. Um, and this is something that is continuing to go on on the data that we've collected already. That never stops, uh, never. right, for any of the, of the four experiments. As we've seen, we got a, a media update from uh, LHCB uh, based on run, run 2, right? Run 2 data. The yes, yes. I mean, we have. Uh, terabytes of data, which is uh, millions of, uh, of gigabytes that uh, need to be analyzed and we use uh, every day to do that even when the accelerator is not uh, running. Uh, for us the last three years, uh, as I said, we, we replaced all the, all the systems that detect the smallest particles with the new technology uh, to cover large areas with uh, affordable technology to read out nevertheless all the data in an even faster way. So. We really use this period to uh, develop the new technologies for, for the next step. Yeah, Manuela, how many theses uh, were done at Atlas uh, during the shutdown <laughs> based on old data? Well, you can imagine, I mean, CMS probably has very similar numbers. At any given time, we have about 1,200 PhD students. And on top of that, we have master's students and undergraduate students and summer students. And uh, all these PhD students need to write a thesis, and they usually do it in about uh, three or four years. So we have several hundred PhD students every year that, who are submitting their thesis and graduating around the world. So you're not missing a uh, quantity of data. So maybe we can go back to the, con to the we're going to go back later to the computing center. In the meantime, there is a question from Jamie. Uh, what is the goal and significance of Phaser? And congratulations, LHC. So thank you for the congratulations. So What's I the purpose say, of Phaser? This is the best question we've got so far. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm actually the spokesperson of the Phaser experiment, so I'm very excited. So Phaser is, a, is really a neat idea, which is to place a very small experiment, but in a very special location. And the location is really... Uh, on the beam collision axis line of sight, we call it. So if you collide your protons and you follow the line of the collision, after quite a long way, 300 meters or so, the LHC starts to bend away to make a circle. And you carry on, you go through 100 meters of rock, and you bump into an unused tunnel. And that's where phaser is situated. And by being situated in this very special location, it means that um, if you produce light new particles in the collisions, they're, they're most likely to go along this line of sight and could be detected by phaser. So the purpose is to twofold. It's to look for neutrinos, as I said, study neutrinos that are produced in these collisions, which are produced in the decay of light particles, but also to search for new weakly interacting light particles, like things like dark photons, which are postulated to um, theories which relate to dark matter and could be seen by phaser in regions which couldn't be seen by other experiments. So for me, it's really an exciting experiment, and uh, we're really looking forward to the first data, which is coming right now. That's fabulous. I was saying we could go back to the data center, but no, we're still getting more questions. That's great. Uh, so Birkin Nedzdet is curious how much hard disk memory is needed for a data so big to generate this kind of experiments. This is a question for Enrica Porcari, the IT department leader. 
who hopefully is following us. Can we have the data center for the answer to this question? Yes, thank you, Paula. Thanks for the question. So we currently have 10,000 uh, disks for, for this, but as I said earlier, we don't only have disks. Uh, disks come with uh, uh, good performance, but also a high cost. And so at the, at the, uh, at the data center, we have to balance uh, costs with performance needs. So as we said, a lot of our, uh, our data is also for long-term storage. Uh, we use tapes for that, uh, for that, uh, for that uh, need. And as I said, also we, we share, we send the data that through, the, uh, through the WLCG. So we use different tools depending on what uh, the need for accessing, as we heard from our, uh, from our colleagues from the, uh, from the experiments and from our partners worldwide. So we calibrate our, our offerings depending on the uh, depending on the needs. But as I said, we expect 1.5 as a byte of data in this uh, uh, in this run. So uh, this gonna, there is a lot of uh, disk, there is a lot of tapes, and there is a lot of networking capacity needed to share the data with the with our partners. I can see some experts with you. Maybe you want to introduce them. Yes, uh, please. Tim Smith. Um, so, uh, Fabiola described a lot about the open science and open data, so I'm uh, um, responsible for a lot of those services. Thank you, Tim. Hello, I'm Maria Arzuaga, and uh, I'm the service manager of, uh, of EOS, our disk storage system for Atlas, CMS, LHCV, and we are very excited about this because we were, prepar uh, we were preparing uh, this with all the experiments, and, uh, and we are ready, so with uh, 600 petabytes and more than 1,000 storage nodes waiting for this data. Thank you very much, uh, our colleagues from uh, the data center. Maybe there are more questions? Yes. Uh, so will there be any neutrino detections again for, for you, Jamie? <laughs> Yeah, so again, um, as I said before, there's two new experiments, two of the smaller experiments at the LHC, just starting up for this run. So the phaser experiment and SND at LHC. And both of these are designed to study neutrinos that will be produced in the LHC collisions. And this is the first time that a neutrino that's produced in a collider will be directly detected by an experiment. So this is really exciting. And one of the cool things is that the neutrinos that you get in this location where phaser and SND are situated are extremely high energy. So they're generally like a thousand times higher energy than most of the neutrino experiments which exist in the world. So they'll be able to really study these high energy neutrinos in a, in a way which hasn't been done before. And that will, I think, is really interesting for such small and quite cheap experiments. This will bring quite a lot to the LHC program in run three. What's the advantage of studying neutrinos made in the lab compared to neutrinos that are flooding us uh, right now, that are an, a huge a deluge of neutrinos? We are immersed in a bath of neutrinos. Why, why do you want to make them in the lab? Well, we have such an abundance in nature. Yeah, well, of course, if you make them in the lab, then you know more about the sort of initial um, conditions. So we, we know what we're colliding and we can predict how many neutrinos these will make and what energy they should have. And so then we can study those and it gives you a sort of more well-defined experiment than we don't know what's happening in space inside the sun, etc. And so it, it's we do know at some level, but it's not such a well-defined experiment. It's, uh, it's compl complementarity is very important. Maybe Fabio can tell us a word about uh, how complementary is this field with uh, astronomy, astrophysics, and cosmology. Uh, they are not only uh, complementary, but they're also very close to friends and very cousin. They are cousin essentially. We essentially we address at least with astrophysics and astroparticle phys um, astrophysics and astroparticle physics the same questions, but we look at them from different perspectives. And so, uh, what we learn at CERN is very important as input also to um, astrophysics and cosmology. What they learn is also very important for us. So, I think that uh, that um, the, the the question that we are addressing, like dark matter, for instance, and others, are so um, so important and so. Um, uh, challenging to address and also so intertwined than a how to say deployment of several approaches those from particle physics accelerator based particle physics astrophysics are absolutely necessary if you want to give an answer to those questions thank you very much um, we can get some more questions if uh, if there are any yes <laughs> what is the absolute best case scenario you're hoping to come from all of this again for you Fabio because you can answer for everybody. <laughs> Otherwise, we should do it through the table, and it, it would take a bit long. Well, I would say, of course, uh, the dream is to uh, be able to uh, to answer some of the open questions and f 
the best scenario for course, of course will be to discover new particles that can uh, for instance uh, tell us what is the, uh, the the composition of dark matter that's of course will be a, a dream scenario why dream scenario because today we know five percent of the universe and we know that 25 percent is made of dark matter so if you discover dark matter then we increase uh, in <laughs> our knowledge from five to thirty percent is absolutely extraordinary but i think that our approach should be the uh, the, the right approach of, of of research is to uh, make progress step by step uh, through uh, a, 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 a measurements of what we know, through uh, looking for new th things, and I'm sure that the uh, round three of DLHC will allow us to make significant step forward in our knowledge of fundamental physics and the universe. Uh, and so, and for me, a discovery is also understanding how a, a very special particle like the Higgs boson uh, behaves, like, or understanding how the quark Coulomb plasma behaves. This is a big discovery. Yes, we are at the frontier of knowledge on the brink of, uh, of new knowledge. Every step we make uh, is, a, is a new new step into the unknown. Mateus, you wanted to add something on behalf of Alice? Well, maybe not only Alice. I, I, I'm let's say a, a, a personal goal for an achievement, all of this will at some point end up in textbooks of physics. So we will pass to future generations the knowledge that they can further on build on that and go beyond where no one has gone before or something like this. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes, exactly. Sandra Mother is already taught so uh, maybe is, is at university, I guess, yeah. not not, uh, beaten, not to undergraduates. Uh, so it's now four of, of, uh, 5.40, and we can take a last question from Pradeep Paniker. If Higgs boson provides mass to all particles, then does it also do for the dark particles, the dark matter particles? Uh, I would give the chance to both Atlas and CMS to answer this question. Uh, so, Manuela, what do you think? Well, if it has mass and certainly it has to interact, I think, with the Higgs boson. We don't know what this dark matter is actually, right? Patricia? Right, exactly. So, but we think it has, that the Higgs will interact with it. That's something that um, we're going to be looking for during run three. And on, on this uh, question that takes us to the frontier of knowledge, I think we can thank everybody, uh, especially uh, our guests here, the protagonists of today, uh, feet, uh, we can uh, invite you to go and celebrate. You, you all deserve that. Thanks uh, to the LHC control and also the other <laughs> machine controls that uh, have been flooded today by people, technicians. Thanks uh, to the technical team. Uh, the live has gone fabulous well, much better than in our wildest dreams. I hope the same is true for the LHC run tree. Thank you, everyone, and see you next time. We have something as big to communicate to the world. Thank you.